Good evening, everyone. We are also doing this online, so I wanna check with our technology folks before we get too far into it, just to make sure that our online process is working as well. And we are good, I got the thumbs up. <clears throat> good evening, I'm Dr. Tim Hansen, uh, Superintendent of MSD Warren Township. Thank you for coming this evening to our community forum on the referendum. Thank you to those who are watching us on Facebook Live or our um, streaming service on our, on our district webpage. One week from today, we will be asking our voters to support our proposed referendum. Tonight, we are scheduled to share with you um, additional details if you don't already know them, um, an opportunity for you to hear directly from some of the amazing people who are doing, doing the work that the referendum supports, and then finally, an opportunity for you to ask questions so that you are informed uh, when you go to the poll next Tuesday. So thank you again for being here. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our CFO, Mr. Matt Parkinson. Good evening, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone this evening about the operating referendum and about the, um, in particular, the financial and the tax implications for the referendum. So by way of background, uh, referenda in Indiana have been a key part of the school funding um, you know, landscape for about 15 years. And really this goes back to the implementation of, of property tax caps. Um, so in the late, around 2008, 2009 in Indiana, we, we had the property tax cap system introduced, um, which, cap, which caps taxes for individual taxpayers at 1% of the value if it's a homestead, or 2% or 3%, depending upon the type of property. Uh, and then around that time too, we saw, we saw a referendum really coming into play. 106 school districts in the state of Indiana out of about 290 um, have passed an operating referendum, a capital referendum or both. Uh, here in MSD Warren, um, we've passed an operating referendum in 2018. Um, we've never run a capital referendum. Capital referenda are used for, for building construction and renovation. Uh, we handle all of our projects of that nature um, within the caps outside of the referendum process. Uh, here in Marion County, nine out of 11 school districts have, have passed um, a referendum, either operating or capital or both. Uh, and then of course, it, it, again, the, the referendum timeline kind of comes back to the implementation of property tax caps. Uh, here in MSD Warren Township over the last four years, we've lost about $14 million to the caps. So that's $14 million that hits our operations fund in particular, so think, um, bus drivers and custodians and, and building maintenance. We expect we're gonna lose about $5 million to the cap here in 2023. So just the, the background on the, the 2018 referendum, uh, we asked the community support for an operating referendum at a maximum tax rate of 21 cents. That's 21 cents per $100 of assessed value. Uh, the community supported it. And at the time the ballot question said that we were um, asking for the community support uh, for five initiatives, and they were transportation, teacher retention and professional development, one-to-one -one technology, safety and security, and then student learning, college and career readiness. Well, in 2023, we're again asking the community for support. Um, this time we're terming it a repeal and replace operating referendum. And what we mean by that is if the community supports the referendum this year, the 30 cent rate, we're going to voluntarily repeal the 2018 referendum with the maximum 21 cent rate. Um, the five items that we have listed on, on the screen are, are really the same five items from 2018. Mildly rephrased to reflect the way that we're using our dollars and intend to use our dollars moving forward. But again, it's transportation, staff retention, professional development and family engagement, technology, safety and security, and then student learning, college and career readiness. So I, I mentioned that in Marion County, 11 school, we, have, we have 11 school districts, nine of which have passed a referendum. Uh, on the screen here, I've got the, the referendum tax rates, again, operating capital or both for the school districts in Marion County. Um, of the nine school districts that have passed a referendum uh, here in MSD Warren, we had the lowest uh, referendum rate in, in 2022 uh, at 21 cents. And again, we're asking the community support for a 30 cent referendum rate, which will put a sixth in the county if the community approves it uh, and still behind five of our peers. In the same way, uh, we take a look at what our referendum levy is. So that's the, the dollar amounts that we raise through property taxes divided by the number of students who attend our school district 
and, and also by this metric, in 2022, we had the lowest referendum levy per, per student out of the nine school districts in the county that passed a referendum. Um, if we're successful at the 30 cent rate, we still anticipate having the lowest referendum levy per student. So we share this as a way of saying, we, we believe that, that um, we're, we're coming out with a reasonable request that's in line with our peers to provide the resources that we need to provide great service to our students. And we certainly don't believe we're an outlier on the upper end when it comes to either tax rate uh, or the dollar amounts we're looking to raise per kid. So one thing that I, I wanna spend just a minute um, sharing with the community is, is the ballot question. So in 2018, when uh, the school district ran the referendum, the ballot question was, was relatively straightforward. Um, among the other texts, it said a property tax rate that does not exceed 21 cents. And again, that's 21 cents per $100 of taxable assessed value. Well, since we ran the referendum in 2018, um, the state law around the way that the ballot question is phrased has changed. And so when voters go to the polls, next week, they're not going to see a 30 cent rate listed. Instead, they're gonna see a uh, ballot language that says the average property tax paid to the school corporation per year on a residence would increase by 29.4%. So I'm, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about how that 29.4% is calculated. Um, but I wanna emphasize, this is not a 29% property tax increase. Um, it's significantly smaller. So the percentage increases are confusing and likely require clarification. And, and really there's two things about it that make it um, difficult to decipher. The first is that it's calculated as if we didn't already have a referendum in place. Um, the reality here in MSD Warren is that we have a 21 cent referendum today. We're asking the community support for a referendum at 30 cents. But that 29% is calculated as if we were going from zero to 30 cents, not from 21 to 30 cents. Uh, and then the other piece of it that I, th I think is probably confusing, understandably, to, to a lot of folks that would read the question is, it's referring to property tax dollars paid to the school district, not an increase on the overall property tax bill. Uh, so in most of the state, including for most of our school district, uh, the school district's portion of the property tax bill is about half. So across most of MSD Warren Township, about half of the property taxes that you pay go to the school district. The balance goes to the county, um, to the city, to the township, to the library system, and so on. Um, for our taxpayers who live in Cumberland, the school district's about a third of the property tax bill. It's just a difference in the, in the municipal rates. So our average homestead here in MSD Warren Township is valued at a little bit under $150,000, 147868 uh, there are three deductions that most homesteads have applied. Every homestead has the standard deduction, which is 45,000, and then a supplemental standard deduction, and then most have a $3,000 mortgage deduction. That leaves the net assessed value or the taxable value on that property a little bit under $64,000. The maximum rate that we're asking for the community support is 30 cents per $100 of taxable assessed value. Um, the maximum rate from the 2018 referendum is 21 cents. And so the proposed increase that we're asking the community support on uh, is nine cents. If we take that nine cent difference, again, that's nine cents per $100 of taxable assessed value, multiplied by that just under $64,000 for uh, the net, net assessed value, uh, we come out to about $57 per year or a little bit under $5 per month. And that's the bottom line for our taxpayers. This is the increase that we're asking for the community support on over the next eight years relative to what folks are paying into the referendum today. And so just phrased a different way, these, these are actual numbers. If, if somebody um, happens to have um, a, a property that's valued at exactly our school district's median, and they live in, in the majority of our school district, um, this property taxpayer would be paying $134 in, in property taxes overall. So that includes um, everything paid to the school district outside of the referendum, and then what's paid again to the county and to the city and to the township. And this taxpayer today would be paying about $11 per month into the referendum. If the referendum is successful, this taxpayer would pay the same, the same $123 on everything other than the referendum. Um, and if we had the 30 cent rate in place instead of the, the 21 cent rate, this taxpayer would be paying about $16 per month. Um, so it comes out to about $5. Um, phrased a different way in the bottom right corner, for, for our average taxpayer, if you could plug in that 30 cent referendum rate in place of the 21 cent referendum rate, the difference on the property tax bill would be about 4%. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's time this evening. I'll be around. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody wants to get into uh, more depth on property taxes or the calculations. With that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our principal of Crescent Intermediate, Intermediate Middle School, Dr. Todd Nalon.
Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Todd Nalon, principal at Creston Intermediate and Middle School. And I'm here actually to talk to you just for a brief moment in regards to uh, what this referendum will do if passed to assist us at Creston. Um, it's, um, safety has always been paramount, but in the day and time in which we live in right now, we know that there is a sense of urgency for safety every day, all day. It is impacting, you know, when we take our walks in the evening, when we go to the mall, when we go shopping, because the, 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 the urgency is just so great right now. And so at Crescent, we have uh, some school safety officers as well as some school uh, resource officers. Both of them have different duties. So with our school safety officer, that is the individual that's in our building every single day, and they are walking our building, they're checking doors to make sure that the doors are locked, uh, and making sure that if there is unlocked doors, that they, are, they lock those back. They build relationships with our kids, and that's important to have them in our schools because if they build those relationships with our kids, our kids are more apt to tell them and alert them if something is happening in the building that should not be happening. And uh, also, our, our school safety officers, they assist me as the building principal if I have to go in and, and do a, a, a locker search or something like that. They're there with me as well, uh, versus our school resource officer who is is actually, you know, police officers, and so they have a different statute that they live by, and that is, um, you know, when we do, for instance, a locker search in our building, you know, our school resource officer is not anywhere nearby us because that's not their jurisdiction. But here's what I love about having our school resource officers in our building. You know, their car is parked outside of our building, and that's the biggest deterrent, you know, for anybody that could possibly think about coming into our building and causing an unsafe environment. That car parked out front is a deterrent. Not only that, our school resource officer will sit at the uh, front desk so that when guests come in, they know that there's a strong police presence in our building. And not only that, too, uh, keeping uh, these uh, resource officers and school safety officers around uh, is important because our school resource officer, they're also connected to the community. So if there's something going on in the community, they are actually working closely with me to, to, for me to help make the decision as to whether or not, you know, should I go on a secure or should I lock down the building based upon what's going on in our community. You know, our goal is to always keep our kids and our families safe. And as a principal, you know, I'm responsible for our children from the time that they leave their homes until the time that they get get to Creston and then get back home. And so having school uh, resource officers and school safety officers is a big plus for any school. Um, also, too, I want to talk about our access to uh, our counselors at fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth grade. You know, we know that this year alone, suicide, um, the rate of suicide went up 36 percent. And we've got a lot of mental illness that's going on in our families. And some of our families just don't have access to the resources. And so having counselors continue in our school is another way that we can provide that extra layer of support for our families. Our counselors are important because they're able to, once again, build relationships with these students. And these students will come to our counselors and they'll tell them about what's going on at home. They'll tell them about what's going on, you know, even in the school. And to, to not have counselors, I just don't know how we would even manage, you know. And so they play a vital, vital role, even with scheduling and, you know, being an extension of the parent where counselors are able to provide students with guidance on, you know, what classes that might interest them because they've built a relationship uh, with these students over, you know, years. And so we, we definitely need our counselors. You know, our family engagement liaison, we also need them as well. This year alone, I have lost, uh, well, I had two families that actually lost homes due to a fire. And it was our FEL that actually went out to those homes and met with 
with those families and provided them resources so that they could, you know, have a place to stay, like in a hotel, and provide resources that connected uh, to these families so they can get food and shelter and clothing. And so, you know, at one point in time, you know, our schools, it used to be back in the day that where we would have what we would call a full service school. We still have that today, but it's much more than just full service because our kids need, you know, everybody in our school. And so to not have even like our FEL would be uh, something that we would have to try and find a way to, to manage without having them. And then finally, I'm here to talk about the access to technology. You know, we do live in a technology age, and so what our students right now, we're one-to-one. -one. Each student has a laptop or they have an iPad. Having access to this particular type of uh, technology, it allows our students to basically, you know, have the the world at their fingertips. Now I know that can be good and that can be bad, but for a child that never gets out of Indianapolis or a child that never gets, you know, to travel, you know, having that one-to-one -one technology allows them to be able to explore different worlds, different cultures, and be able to have access to the world. And so we're just asking you to support this. Oh, and now we're gonna have Miss uh, Susie Cordy, if she could come up at this town, time, she's a one bus driver. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Hanson, for this opportunity to um, speak this evening. I'm Susie Cordy, bus number 30. 20 years ago, I was driving to my job and I would pass this bus and this lady was driving the bus and she always had this big old smile on her face. And I was in a rut with my current job so I filled out an application. Well, next thing you know, I brought my box home, told my husband I quit my job and I was gonna drive a school bus. After I revived him, he learned to be okay with it. <laughs> right, Craig? Is Craig in the house? <laughs> Anyway, um, the lady who was smiling turned out to be my trainer, and soon bus 68 was my bus. I've been a driver for 20 years, and it's been the best job and most rewarding job I've ever had. I've driven for Renaissance, Raymond Park, and Creston. I now drive for Warren Central and Sunny Heights. Shout out to Miss Taylor there. <laughs> it's not a glamorous job. You get up very early in the morning to get our buses ready to go pick up our students. Safety is our number one commitment. We are the first ones to see our students in the morning and the last ones to see them when they leave in the afternoon. We set the tone for our students. If a student gets on the bus and they're upset, they might just need a hug or hear some positive words. We care deeply for our kids. We form bonds of trust, set expectations, and give praise. We show concern, empathy, and laugh at silly jokes. We tie shoes, fix zippers and backpacks, apply Band-Aids, and clean up those messes, and I have not had to clean one up yet. <laughs> I love my job because I, make, I know I make a difference. We celebrate birthdays on my bus. My kids respect me, and in turn, I respect them. Could I retire? Yes. However, my kids keep me going, especially this last year. They bring me joy and keep me young, even my high schoolers. So with that said, I'll be back again next year. So please go vote yes for this referendum so we can keep the ball rolling. And now it's my turn to introduce another smiling face, Ms. Tabitha Johnson. Hello, Warren Township, hello. My name is Tabitha Jackson. I am the parent liaison at Eastridge Elementary School. I also live and work in Warren Township. Tonight, I will talk about my time as a family engagement liaison and the impact that this position has had at Eastridge and the greater Warren Township community. And yes, I wear this hat proudly, but my first hat, my favorite hat is my mama hat. My husband Darius and I, we have two girls in third and fourth grade at Lakeside. They are both in the high ability program. As a Warren Township parent, I 100% support this referendum. As a parent, I want my children 
to have the technology that they need to be competitive in the future job market. I want them to have competent teachers who are knowledgeable in the latest education practices. I want them to feel safe and secure when at school. I want to feel safe when they are at school. This referendum will help support that. I want them to have access to counselors at school when needed. I want my children to have access to the things they need at school so that they continue to, to grow into amazing little people. As I mentioned earlier, I am also the family engagement liaison at Eastridge Elementary. I have held this position since July 2021 when it was first created. I've been so lucky to have this position. As an FEL, I'm able to build relationships with the families at Eastridge and also provide some critical resources for those families when needed. Having a liaison in each and every school has been an absolute game changer. FELs come to work with a different perspective than teachers and admin. We are simply here to help improve our school community by being the bridge between home and school. We are the welcome committee for new families. We are the listening ear when our parents need us. We are there when a family is on the brink of ev eviction. We are there when a family experiences a house fire. We are who our caregivers come to when they need extracurricular opportunities or even tutoring options. We are the ones helping to break down the barriers that our families face. Each liaison carries their own tool belt of resources. We also share some of those resources. Some of the resources that family engagement liaisons like myself utilize are Moorhead Community Resource Center, which is an amazing umbrella of resources for all of the families in our district. We can recommend them for Indie Rent, which is actually just opening back up to assist our families with renting with rent when needed. Some of the other resources that we are able to provide are winter coats for our students, food pantries, community organizations like Child Care Answers, Cafe, Firefly 211, baby assistance for new moms, back to school and Christmas assistance, GED and diploma recovery classes at Highlander Park, new homeowner classes, free eye exams and glasses, the Medicaid waiver, there's so much that we can help with. Some of the other initiatives that FELs like myself have been a part of are building community relationships and creating family events. So what's the impact of a family engagement liaison? Why is it important? Well, for one, our school attendance is up. Our students and families really feel like they belong at Eastridge and they wanna to come to school. Parents are back in the building volunteering their time and supporting our school in so many ways through donations. Families have an advocate in every school building to help support them when needed. Let me give you a quick example. I worked with a single mother of a young autistic son. She called me for Christmas assistance. However, by the end of the conversation, I learned that this mom needed Christmas assistance because she had to reduce her work hours from full-time to part-time to take care of her son. It drastically reduced her income and she couldn't afford Christmas that year. So what I learned from that conversation was that she needed reliable childcare for her son so that she could provide like she wanted to. So together, that's what we did. We found her the perfect daycare for her son, transportation services, and the ability to care for her autistic child were at the top of that list. We found a great fit for them. I was also able to sign them up for the Medicaid waiver this is a service that will provide out-of-school services and therapies for her son. This waiver even includes respite care so that mom can go grocery shopping by herself every now and then. Or he can go to an ABA summer camp. This mother asked for Christmas assistance, but she ended up with so much more. I'm gonna share one more success story with you. There was a second grader earlier this year. She was low in reading and she was showing signs of vision impairments. I called mom to reach out and see how I could help with this. She mentioned she just didn't have money for the exam. It was on her to-do list, 
but she just couldn't fit it in the budget. I was able to provide mom with a voucher for a free eye exam and free glasses for her daughter. It was such a relief for that mother. Later that semester, that same second grader had the highest growth in reading on her NWES in the fall. She grew over 60 points, all because she could now see what she was reading. So why should this matter to the greater Warren community? The family engagement liaisons across our district are making sure our students and our families have what they need to thrive. When our students have what they need, our caregivers, the families, are able to be successful in so many other ways. It truly is a trickle effect for our entire community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for supporting the children, the staff, and everybody that makes Warren Township so incredible. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Amy Moeller, a counselor at Warren Central High School. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can I just say amen? That was wonderful. The things that our township is doing is mind boggling. This is my 25th year here as an adult. And I like to say it's way more than that as an individual. I am a proud graduate of Warren Central. And it's one of my favorite topics to speak on. I love Warren. I love our community. I love our students. I love our relationships. This place does more than just educate children. Clear, think about that. That is a huge endeavor in and of itself. But I would just ask that everybody please go back to our mission. All we're asking with this referendum is that mission, to continue with the tradition of innovation, with having safe and caring environments, with providing exceptional learning experience, experiences, meaningful relationships for all our students, our families, and our educators. I have to tell you, as someone that's been in this community for my whole life, I'm not the exception but the norm in that I have former students, I'm the godparent of their children. I've been in weddings. I've unfortunately attended funerals. And I've seen what our community can do in all of those happy, sad, difficult situations when we come together. And that's what we're asking for this evening. We just need to come together to provide that exceptional quality that we have always done for the last almost 50 years that I've been around. Through my experience as a Spanish teacher, an academic coach, and now as a counselor, I can tell you that I was never fully aware of what a counselor did until I stepped into the role. No amount of classes or education were able to teach me that. But I can now tell you that although when I speak to my father, he always says, I don't I, I had a counselor, right? I had one. I said, Dad, I think you did. And I went through the explain when they started, all of that. And he said, well, I think, did I maybe meet her once? And I said, Dad, I'm not too sure. He was like, I know she talked to me about what I was going to do after high school. Uh, well, that's a wonderful thing and very important, Dad, but we do a little more than that now. He said, I know. I see kids coming up to you all the time, and I hear you talk about your students, and what do you do, Amy? So let me tell you what we do. We do way more than scheduling, and I know a lot of you have experience with counselors where maybe, well, when you were in high school, you saw them once a year to fill out your schedule. Luckily, we're in a situation now, we have gone from having almost 500 students on our caseloads to barely 300. What that allows us to do is I not only see my students once a year, I see them individually at least twice a year, in addition to once a month via our um, town hall meetings that we get 
to participate in, as well as when I'm interacting with students in a small group. That extra time allows me to do what we call a Laney League with our facility dog, another amazing program. We have had the opportunity to go into classrooms um, 43 times semester one to participate in tier one interventions. Um, we also have seen over 5,000 students in one semester. And although that number is not a lot different from when we had a smaller or a larger group of counselors, the time that we get to spend with each student is significantly increased. So we're no longer just putting a Band-Aid on situations and saying, good luck, kids, but instead really sitting down and creating a plan with the student and giving the student time to interact and speak with us. We work with our scholars um, for 21st century scholars, graduation requirements, um, career pathway opportunities and adherence, social and emotional concerns, mental health concerns, family concerns, academic concerns, safety concerns, college recommendations and scholarships, as well as emergency situations that they might encounter. And I like to think of us a little bit as that glue. So we are blessed to have lots of resources in our district, but school counselors as student advocates are able to really connect the kids to those resources. Our family liaisons have been uh, invaluable to us this year and that when we do have some of those severe emergency situations like unfortunately fires or the passing of a parent or loved one, our liaisons have really been able to gather those resources quickly and give them to our families and we're so grateful for those types of situations. And so what I really am trying to say is that now we're able to be proactive. We don't have to be reactive anymore. We are able to interact with our students and provide them those relationships that our mission statement tells us that we will do. And no matter how much I speak, students really are the way that you can learn about this. And I've brought along my friend, um, Aridan Eulis. Aridan is, uh, currently a senior at Warren Central High School and an excellent example of what our students are capable of and able to do with just a little guidance and support from the adults. Go ahead here. Um, hello, um, my name is Erdin Eulis. I'm currently a senior at Warren Central. Uh, going to high school, I walked in there not taking it seriously, honestly. I thought it was gonna be like high school musical, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be kinda like that. Um, turns out it wasn't. Uh, I used to avoid the counselors. When their passes, I'm not trying to get in trouble, Ms. Taylor, but I did skip, I ain't, I ain't gonna lie, I did skip. <laughs> I was avoiding the counselors, uh, my grades was low. Then, I had a counselor named Ms. Shrein. She didn't hunt me down, she found me. Um, we was talking and she made me open up. She made me realize that I should take it seriously. Um, so my grades went up sophomore year. We got switched to online, but my counselor still got um, in touch. So I still took it seriously. <coughs> now senior year, I'm with Ms. Hankley. Um, without her, I really don't think I would be able to graduate early, which I did. Um, I'm an AB student. Um, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Um, uh, my plan is right now, I got a scholarship. Uh, then I got accepted in the Ivy Tech and Marion University. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I got invited to play softball for Marion too. And right now, I'm still trying to think what I'm gonna do. I wanna do criminal justice or either, I also wanna be a barber. I know, a barber sounds interesting. Um, sorry, I'm kinda nervous, guys. I've never spoken in a crowd before. 
but without Miss Hinkley, I don't think I would actually have done it. I needed the support I didn't have. And yeah, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Aridan. You did an excellent job. Everything that Aridan just said has always been in her. No one here changed any of that. All our staff has done is support her, encourage her, and remind her that she has that capability. She is able to do anything she wants. Here are all the resources, Aridan. She was the one that took advantage of those. So what we're asking, Warren Township, is please give our students the opportunity to take advantage of those resources. Give our children the possibility to go beyond what they think they can to what we know they can. Thank you. And Dr. Hansen, please come on up. Real men cry. Uh, if that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, I don't know what, what will. Um, you know, as we ask our community to make an investment in the people and the programs that we have in Warren Township, you heard those situations and, and um, stories come to life tonight. Uh, the people that are doing this work, the very important work that our, that our mission says that we will do, um, takes, takes resources. And with the pandemic coming on board, the Family Engagement Liaison was a new position that we invested in through our federal um, relief dollars. And those are expiring. And that's one of the big reasons why we're going after the referendum right now is to make sure we maintain the support, the resources, the relationships that the Family Engagement Liaisons have on a daily basis. Um, and you, you heard a couple of those stories tonight. Um, I do want to talk about the negative. If this referendum does not pass, we do have a current referendum in place until 2026. This is year five. It's generating just about $7 million, but that falls short of what we want to continue to do. If the referendum fails, the family engagement liaisons go away. We, we cannot sustain those as a district. As much as we want to and need to, we do not have the adequate referent, uh, revenue to do that. Um, the other programs, the counseling piece, all of our 512 counselors are paid um, via the referendum right now. If the referendum does not pass, us being able to sustain that is, at, is in jeopardy. We, we would have to pull from other resources in order to do what, look, there's a formula that we even fall short of at a national level of how many students a counselor should be connected to, and it's 250. And we're proud in Warren Township that we're in the 300s, but we still fall short of what, what we should be giving our students access to. You know, we serve a high, a high school dependent community, which means our families rely on us for a lot. And by us being able to take those barriers away, when tragedy happens or they're dealing with life experiences, they can focus on student learning. And without those barriers being removed, our students are sitting in classrooms worrying about where they're gonna to eat tonight, where they're gonna go home to. And we've gotta take that burden off of their, their, their mind, we gotta take that burden out of their heart so they can focus on what they're going to do with their life. Because every generation that comes through Warren Township, we wanna keep getting better and better. So, you know, I don't wanna create this doom and gloom situation, but the reality is we need this money to do what we need to do to continue the stories that you heard tonight and we, we are asking our community to support that in, in one week from tonight. Um, at this time, we are gonna open it up for questions uh, for those community members that are here tonight. We don't necessarily have a, a mic, but if you, would, if you have a question that you would like to ask um, in this setting, um, if you could you know, raise your hand, we can call on you and um, answer any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am.
Mr. Clayton, can I ask for your assistance on this one in terms of our safety forums and things that we're looking at? What school are your uh, children at? Are you able to share? Liberty Park.
Well, we, you are doing your part, and we appreciate it. We we thank you for the. We want dialogue, right? We, a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve are community problems, not just unique to the east side, but all over. And we have to come together to help solve those problems together. Do you know Latina Pettis, uh, who's the family engagement liaison at Liberty Park? Yeah. Uh, you are doing your part. You're doing your part. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Start recruiting. Maybe that, that will help you out. What other questions can we can we answer for you? Uh, it's great feedback, and unfortunately, we, we live in a day where there's more positive, but the negative is louder, and we're challenged by that because things happen. We're a big school system. We're a big, um, you know, area of the city. Two major events happened last week that had nothing to do with our school district and that we were forced to respond to, and, and we did a great job responding to that and making sure our kids were safe and making sure um, our staff and, and community was as safe as possible. And um, you know, we accept that challenge, Mr. Wilson. We, we know we gotta, we gotta do more to that. I know who you are. I, I appreciate your support. <laughs> um, because there's so much good, and you heard it tonight. You, 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 we've gotta do a better job of getting the positive out there. Last night we were at our top 30 banquet at the high school. Our kids are doing amazing things and going to amazing places after they leave, leave us. And, um, we're human, we're, we, we, we have get betters, and we, we are doing everything we can to get better, but that is a challenge. The next week, I think you started off with what are we doing this next week? Obviously, we have this tonight. We're speaking to the Grassy Creek community tomorrow night. Um, we're at the early polls. We're gonna be at election day, um, talking to voters. Um, as many champions as we can get for this is great, but only the voter matters, because only the voter who goes to the poll to say yes matters to us. So matters in, in getting it approved that everyone matters to us. But um, so, and, you know, we have more communications reaching out to, to voters this week too with our volunteers and, you know, getting that message out. It, we want everyone to, to approve it, but if you don't, I wanna make sure you are informed with all the information and for whatever reason you chose not to approve it is, is your decision. But we wanna make sure that you have all the information you need to make an informed decision. Yes, sir. That is a great question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, is it on the it's not on the ballot question? So the repeal and replace, yeah.
Thank you. Okay, so we're all thumbs up. Love it. No, Mr. Shelton, got a question? Sure thing. So, so um, the question was, um, when was, and tell me if I got this right, when was the estimate developed in terms of what the cost impact is going to be to, to a property taxpayer? Yeah, mainly just the, the current numbers that we have now. Sure, and, and so the, the numbers that, that folks are looking at when they have their property tax bill now, did they have an impact on our estimates? And, and they do. So I, I wanna answer that question in, in two different ways. The first is we, we began working on kind of the concept for the referendum well over a year ago before we knew what assessed values were going to do. And, and our process that we went through was identifying the costs of the, the programs that we were looking to sustain. So the things that we were doing through the referendum plus those items through um, our federal pandemic relief. And then we came to roughly $11 million per year that, that we needed to sustain. Um, and, and so we arrived at the levy that we were going to ask the community support before we recognized what assessed values were gonna do. So the dollar amount we went back to the community with from a tax rate perspective is actually lower than what we were in, internally contemplating. It, it was really, again, just driven on what the needs were. Um, in terms of the, the percentage increase, um, it's the, the dollar impact to the taxpayer is um, the, so we, we multiply the net assessed value um, by that 21 cent tax rate and the net assessed value by the 30 cent tax rate. That, that nine cent difference it is the entire difference. And so we have a portion of the property tax bill that goes to um, other items for all local governments, including the school corporation, not impacted by the property tax referendum itself. The, the referendum impact is strictly the nine cents. I, I'd be happy to talk with you more. I'm, I'm, okay. We are gonna um, stay around, so if you wanna meet with any of us individually, uh, we will be here. For those that are online, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Um, you can email myself, um, thanson at warren.k12.in.us. I'd be happy to facilitate that, that conversation with either Mr. Parkinson or anyone who needs to answer that question. Um, but you can send those questions to us and um, at any point. So. Really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you for your investment in Warren um, Scholars and our schools and, and um, our community. And um, we appreciate your support a week from today.